Convocations are one of the older traditions in the academy. They go back to at least the 1500s and the Middle Age universities in, in Germany. They're used for a variety of events uh, to celebrate uh, distinguished faculty members in retirement, to open buildings and all sorts of things, but mostly to do, most often, to do what we are doing today, to mark the beginning of a new academic year and to welcome a new group of people into our very special college community. Almost all institutions, and I'm going to be talking about institutions here a, a bit, almost all institutions have their own traditions and rituals, and certainly colleges, including Centenary, are no different. If anything, colleges and universities have more traditions. Some of them are, are perhaps silly. Maybe you've seen the brickwork out in the, in, near my building about the bagels, uh, a tradition that uh, has, has uh, largely been forgotten, I think. Uh, Maybe you've seen the old footage of Centenary or other colleges where freshmen were required to wear beanies uh, for their first year. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, the returning GIs from World War II, uh, it was hard to tell them that they had to wear a beanie uh, when they were freshmen. <laughs> Some of our traditions and rituals are very serious, including the honor code that we have just uh, been presented. But all of these traditions and rituals serve in their own way to bind us into a community. And so that's what I want to spend a few minutes talking about today. I'm speaking especially to our first year students as, since this is uh, the end of your, of your orientation period along with the, with the uh, centenary, uh, what? No, the event tomorrow night, I'm blanking on the, the name of it. But. Uh, I hope you're feeling uh, challenged but not overwhelmed. This is a special time to welcome you into a community. But I want to ask you, Karen, uh, we didn't coordinate this, but this works out well. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Some of you, how many of you, show of hands, how many of you have either seen the book, seen the book or read the movie, read the book or seen the movie of John Irving's The Cider House Rules? Uh, handful. Uh, it, uh, the book is good, the movie is good, they're very different, uh, but they're both uh, good in their own way. Anyway, there's a character in that book who asks what I'm going to ask you. What business are you in? What business are you in? Now, he doesn't mean what's your occupation. He means something much deeper. What's really important to you? And I challenge us today, both as individuals and as an institution, to ask that question. We certainly at Centenary ask it a lot. What business are we in? At some level, I suspect the answer is pretty obvious. Something about learning, I hope. But it's not that easy. Are we preparing you for your first job or your fifth job or your tenth job in an era when if statistics hold out, you will change not just jobs, but careers five to seven times. A third of you will take a job when you graduate that doesn't exist today. What does it mean to be preparing you for that? Or are we preparing you in more abstract ways to be a citizen, to be a critical thinker, to be a person of morals? I'm sorry to say that some of our colleagues' schools seem to be in other businesses entirely. Some of our colleagues seem to be in the football business. That's okay for them, I suppose. But we take our business seriously, and I want you to ask yourself, what business are you in? As we come together in a community, in this business is a community, and I want to, again, spend just a couple of minutes talking about what it means to be in community. Communities are special types of institutions. Now, as, as Dr. Soule mentioned, my scholarly work is around international cooperation, and one of the ways that structure international cooperation, cooperation of all sorts, is, are institutions. And you can think of it in a two-by-two two matrix. Social scientists love two-by-two two matrices. Uh, on one dimension, institutions can be formal, you know, the, the Supreme Court. You can write a letter to it. It can be formal. Or institutions can be informal, but you understand if you understand that institutions are simply sets of rules. Some sets of rules 
are informal, but they can be very powerful. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote about the power of the laws of fashion and how terrible it was if you went out violating the laws of fashion. There's a whole school of public opinion about the way we respond to the institutions of, that we feel from public opinion. They're not written down, but they're very, they can be very powerful. So our other dimension is, are these institutions binding? Do they affect our behavior or do they not affect our behavior? Communities are frequently special institutions because they have these informal rules that are very, can be very binding. And whether that's the community of Centenary, the community of Shreveport, the community of the United States, et cetera, I'm concerned that, to use a phrase, the ties that bind these communities may be fraying, may be weakening. I didn't anticipate having this opportunity to talk to you today, so I've actually recorded a little video message. I don't know if we'll use it now, but, uh, but in there I, I talk about the way that behaviors, ways we treat each other, ways we talk to each other that would have been considered unthinkable in times past are now considered routine. Those ties that bind our community, the rules of engagement, if you will. How do we know what to expect from one another? What to expect from one another? I don't know if you paid attention to the, to the words that our choir just sang there. If you're not familiar with them, I encourage you to become so. They're actually in, your, in the, in the uh, hymnal that you have, or you can look up the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. It's, uh, comes, it is uh, in the tradition of John Wesley, and it's part of a, uh, can be part of a service that people in the Wesleyan and the United Methodist tradition uh, may say at the beginning of every year. But th the important part for today is to understand that it's a covenant. It's two ways. In this case that Wesley's writing about, it's a covenant between us and God. But covenants that bind communities, can, there can be all sorts, but the important thing to recognize is that they are two-way streets. The covenants bind us together. And today, we celebrate the fact that we are coming together, bound together, as a community of a very special type. Higher education communities are particularly special because of the goals of our community. The goals of our community are the pursuit of knowledge, which then takes us into even harder questions, and our faculty can, can help you wrestle with these because we've been wrestling with these as a humanity for centuries. What counts as knowledge? What counts as truth? Where do our beliefs fit in? What are facts? You sometimes, we sometimes hear, and it's a, it's a useful phrase in some respects, everyone's entitled to their own set of opinions, but they're not entitled to their own set of facts. Well, but we're going to ask you to think about how you know what fact is. There's a famous graph, I just ran across it fairly recently, again, the, it graphs um, how much you know about a subject with how sure you are about it. And when you just start learning something, you're really sure you know it all. And then you get to a point, you've gotten a little way in, and you think, holy crap, I don't know any of it. And then as you finally reach the top, the top, as you get further into wisdom, you learn that there's limits to what you know. And you'll always be pushing those. So this covenant community that we're in, pushing on knowledge, truths, facts. Many of you are familiar, uh, certainly our faculty, and many of you, if you're not familiar yet, by the time you graduate, will be familiar with the work of Thomas Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions, where he talks about paradigms and the way we fit facts into structures to make them comfortable for us. And the most famous example is the way we fit the facts of the way the planets move into originally a system where the earth was at the center until the disconnects of those facts grew so weighty 
that the Copernican revolution came about and we understood the movement of the planets. We fit those facts together in very different ways. We're constantly challenged with hard truths, hard questions. The, I was, one of the fields, I'm blessed that we have people here on the faculty and maybe in the student body that understand this, because I surely don't. The whole issue of quantum mechanics, that things can be in two places at the same time and they're neither here nor there. That's one of my favorite phrases, but I don't usually mean it literally. Things are neither here nor there. How do we understand that? How do we come together? These are hard conversations, friends. They're hard questions. We challenge you to explore, to push on your preconceived notions, to push us on our preconceived notions, to be prepared to be challenged by things that are different than you think now, by people that are different than you're familiar with. But the main point of today is that in this community, we do that in an atmosphere of respect. And we do it together. We do it together. I'm going to close with an anecdote that I shared with the faculty a couple of years ago. They may or may not remember. Um, it actually is taken from the autobiographical, the memoir of John Lewis, the famous hero of the civil rights movement, representative from Georgia. And he talked about how when he grew up in uh, rural Georgia, he and a number of his relatives had adjacent farms. Uh, some of them were sharecroppers, some of them owned their property. But the children would come together in one house uh, under the, uh, guy, the gaze of their aunt Sephora. One day a tornado, or a line of tornadoes, was coming, approaching, a, ph a phenomenon that we're familiar with. And I'll just read to you from John Lewis's autobiographic, autobiography. That was when Aunt Sephora, I can't, I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name because I don't have my glasses on, told us to clasp hands. Line up and hold hands, she said, and we did as we were told. Then she had us walk as a group toward the corner of the room where the house was lifting off the foundation. From the kitchen to the front of the house we walked, the wind screaming outside, sheets of rain beating on the tin roof. Then we walked back in the other direction as the other end of the house began to lift. And so it was, back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weight of our small bodies. And then another corner would lift and we'd go there and eventually, inevitably, the storm would settle and the house still stood. But we knew another storm would come and we would have to do it all over again. And we did. And I'll close with John Lewis's words, but they apply to us. And so we still do, all of us, you and I, children holding hands, walking with the wind. This is America to me, not just the movement for civil rights, but the endless struggle to respond with decency, dignity, and a sense of brotherhood to all the challenges that face us as a nation, as a college, as a whole. Thank you.